So I'd like to get things underway and ask David if he could um, do the formal acknowledgement and introduce himself and introduce Julia and let her, let her get on with her presentation. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. They are the custodians of the land on which we're, most of us are meeting for thousands of years and the land has deep cultural significance to them. I'd like to acknowledge that we're meeting on this land, that we seek to listen to them and learn to them in a spirit of reconciliation. And I'd like to also pay our respects to their elders past, present and future, and also to any other First Nations people who may be with us today. Today is a day to learn about a wonderful citizen science program that we've got in our own backyard. Um, citizen science is an absolutely phenomenal way for members of the community to connect with and better understand the natural world. It's for our own knowledge and pleasure, but also uh, to contribute to the well-being of the natural environment, because it helps build an evidence base, and it, which then helps us to further care and protect the, our environment. But it really now gives me great pleasure to introduce Julia, who's part of a, this great citizen science program, who's Water Watch, which is really our very own community. And it's an absolute delight to have her here today to tell us all about it. And just briefly, Julia is this title I picked up today, Water Watch and Rapid Response to Litter After Rainfall Coordinator, which is a magnificent title. I love it. And has been with the Merry Creek Management Committee for four years. Julia also has a teaching background and she was also worked for local government. Which is, I think where we may have first crossed paths but working at Banyul for seven years. So somebody who really knows this area and really knows, uh, has a, a, an awful lot of experience to share with us. She's going to discuss the war, current water quality pollution and its major inputs. What's, you know, we as a community are doing and can do to reduce pollution levels and how we can be involved in important waterway ecology and citizen science work, even during the current restrictions. So look, Julia, it's over to you to tell us about litter and frogs and no doubt many other things. Thank you. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Thank you um, to ACF today for, for inviting me along. So I'm looking forward to uh, talking to you all. Great to see you here. Um, it was so hard when I spoke to Trevor and uh, David about what do you want me to talk about? Um, there were so many things that I could focus on. So, um, you know, Trevor's probably going to have to cut me off in some spots because I tried to make it 25 minutes and I struggled. Um, so <laughs> we'll see how we go. There's so much going on that I found that really difficult. So um, I look forward to, to sharing that all with you. So this is what I was going to focus on today, uh, the current ecological health of the Mary and Mooney Ponds Creek, like a general overview. And I'll be looking at some of the strategies that stakeholders have written the main point source pollutants that we currently see that I'm sure all of you that are here are probably quite familiar with, um, and the role that Mary Creek Management Committee, Friends of Mary Creek and the community, and there are many other groups, um, such as the Friends of Mooney Ponds Creek, of course, as well. There's many groups and community individuals playing uh, a role to improve the creek ecological health, you know, in conjunction with um, the stakeholders that David mentioned before as well. There's so much going on, but still so much to do. Uh, some of you might recognise that photograph on the left. That's actually the Mooney, the lovely Mooney Ponds Creek, um, right near my house in Brunswick West, actually. Um, and you can see, obviously, a lot of the issues that we're sort of facing, uh, that, that channelisation going on there, that, that concrete that's um, apparent in so many parts of the Mooney Ponds Creek. Um, and it's really exciting to know that... Um, the Mooney Valley Council and Moreland Council have a 50-year plan for the Mooney Ponds Creek. But um, I was really excited to read read some of that, but then also a bit like, oh, 50 years. So, you know, it just shows you it's a long time to try and reverse some of the things that have happened over the last 50 years, I suppose. Um, so just a bit about river and creek conditions in general. This, this report's a little bit old now. Um, the Port Phillip and Western Port Regional Health River Strategy from 2007, but it's still pretty relevant. Uh, analysis back then showed that 25% of rivers and creeks in Melbourne are in good or excellent condition, and 75% are in moderate to very poor. And the results really reflect the land use pattern. I really like this map because I am a geographer, <laughs> uh, but what I really like about it um, is that it shows really clearly the correlation between, unfortunately, 
urbanisation usually goes hand in hand with poor water quality. So you can see at the, the legend down the bottom, the key, you've got um, the index of river condition, which basically is a rating. They, they, they take in a number of things such as is there presence of uh, macroinvertebrates, you know, what, what biological life is in the rivers and creeks? What are the physical chemical parameters like, the salinity, the, the nutrients, the oxygen? Is there habitat um, on the beds and banks of the creek? What's the hydrology look like? And they put that all together in a rating. So you can see excellent is a dark blue line um, and it goes right down to very poor, which is red. Now, the other thing on this, this key you can see is um, urban areas is a pink colour. So if you have a look then at the map at the Port Phillip Bay, you can see, uh, which is this is the Port Phillip Bay catchment that we're looking at obviously in Melbourne, that all the pink area, pretty much everything that's in the pink area is red. So very poor. There are some exceptions. You can see some green areas and some sections of the, the Yarra River. And obviously in our catchment areas like um, just northeast of Warburton where we have closed catchments. So those areas are looking quite good. But unfortunately where we have a lot of our urban areas, usually the creeks are very poor condition, which is quite a sad state of play really. And I think that's our challenge, you know, in the next decades is, well, how do we, why does it have to be that way? Just because you live in an urban area, does your creek have to have a very poor index of river condition? You know, does it have to be that way? Uh, I got some more maps because I love them. Um, this is from the Melbourne Water, a much more recent report from last year, um, co-design catchment program um, for the Maribyrnong catchment. And there's also one on the Yarra catchment. And some of you here might've been involved in that. Um, there was a lot of um, community consultation on these particular um, plans that Melbourne Water did. And it's got some really excellent maps. This is actually the Mooney Ponds um, catchment. So the Mooney Ponds Creek. Um, it's really interesting. You can see most of the catchment area uh, with the creek in green flowing through the middle is urbanised, highly urbanised. Uh, there's some spots sort of north of Greenvale around Oakland's Junction that are currently not as highly urbanised, but the pink areas in this map, all the sort of bone coloured, are for future urban. So there's obviously going to be more happening. Um, one of the other things in the key that's quite interesting, it's got a couple of um, lines Dark green is the high quality vegetation to maintain. So what's already existing there to maintain, where the high, the highlighted sort of green highlight is vegetation buffers to establish or maintain. So you can see there, there's not really, I've had a good look, unless anyone can tell me if they can see it, there's not really any dark green lines at all. There is no high quality vegetation to maintain. But some of the other things that the report talks about um, is the major threats to the Mooney Ponds catchment, um, which most of you will be quite familiar with, and it's very similar for the Mary catchment. And I'll go through some of these in a bit more detail. So pollutants and sediment, pest plants and animals, rapid urbanisation, climate change, modifications and diversions to the actual hydrology of the stream itself, uh, intensity of stormwater and litter. These are some of the things um, from that um, same co-design plan that sort of show you a bit more about the key values. And it's quite interesting because they've sort of got in grey boxes up the top the current state of these values, the current trajectory, if so, if the management that's happening now continues and it's not increased or, you know, no more funds are put in and no more work's put in. And, but then a target of, of if, if we can get the resources to continue to improve things, what that value will look like. So I'm not going to go through all of them, but I just wanted to mention some of them. The top one's interesting. Birds in the riparian area is moderate. And if we continue with the current management, it'll actually, they'll actually decrease. So obviously we've got to do more in those areas. Uh, fish as well are very low at the moment. I mean, I think for both the Mary and Mooney Ponds Creek, the main fish species are introduced fish, such as carp and redfin and uh, mosquito fish. Um, so again, mo much more work needs to be done for suitable in-stream and riparian habitat for fish. Frogs as well uh, is very low. It was low at the moment, and if we don't do more, we'll become very low. Um, other than in some protected areas, and I know Anna and others here are probably quite familiar with frogs. Um, and the thing I guess like a lot of our frog species um, in the Mary Creek and the Mooney Ponds is there's very few of these populations of frogs that are there that are living in the main stem of the stream. There are some pockets up on the northern parts of the Mary Creek, but most of the frogs that are living there that you've got a good population are normally in protected wetlands. So they're not actually in the main uh, stem of the creek unless it's sort of um, 
slower water and sort of moved into sort of like a billabong, I suppose, and has a bit more protection. Uh, along with frogs, macroinvertebrates and platypus are low or very low. Um, so that, that biological life um, at the moment is quite low. And if you don't have macroinvertebrates, you're not going to get other, um, all these other animals I've just talked about, fish, birds and platypus, because that's their main food source. Uh, platypus need half their body weight of macroinvertebrates a day to eat. Uh, and that's just currently probably not available for them in either uh, Mary or Mooney Ponds Creek. So that's quite sort of depressing <laughs> looking at that. But what we've got really strong in both the Mary and Mooney Ponds Creek is the amenity and the community connection and recreation value. So people really value um, the Mary and Mooney Ponds Creek. And I think we've seen over COVID how much, you know, it's almost loving to death, <laughs> we've, we've seen in some of the media release, uh, releases lately as well. But we can also harness that, um, and, and it has been harnessed by a lot of community groups over the last, you know, couple of decades, that people love it. Well, let's let's get them to do good things for the creek, you know, and continue to Im improve people's knowledge and, and educate the, the younger generation. So we've got those great things we can continue to harness to, to, to improve things. Um, just a couple of things about the Merry Creek, um, same report. This is the upper reaches, and it's just a nice comparison. At the moment, um, it's not without its issues, obviously, in the upper part of the Mary, but you can see just a quite difference. There is actually some high quality vegetation still in certain areas, and a lot of landholders have actually helped keep those high vegetation corridors open. So it's thanks to a lot of landowners in those areas. Unfortunately, some of these areas are changing. Um, Beveridge and Wallen are having more urbanisation. There's more housing plan to go in. Um, and, it, you know, some sections will look a bit more like the southern part around um, Craigie Burn as well. But if as long as we recognise that there are these really important vegetation areas to look after and, and continue to do, a lot of this has been greyed out for stormwater priority areas. So there's lots of areas where they're trying to really treat and manage the stormwater better. Um, hopefully things will, you know, look a lot better than they have in the southern parts of this area. Of the, of the creek. One other thing I want to mention in the key here, you can see that sort of khaki green colour, that's Growling Grass Frog Conservation Reserve. So there's a number of spots that they've, they've put aside to be for Growling Grass Frog, which is one of our threatened um, frog species. Um, they need quite deep water uh, and, they, and they need quite a good, of good vegetation cover. So they have quite a lot of um, conditions that they need to survive and they're a pretty amazing frog. So it's really good to see that there's some areas set aside for them. And we know that they are occurring in, in some sections of the Mary Creek. Uh, Mary Creek has very similar issues to the to Mooney Ponds Creek as well. And this is the lower section of the, the Mary Creek. So you can see quite a difference to that map I just showed you before. Highly urbanised, uh, no high quality vegetation to maintain, a little bit of vegetation buffers to, to, to increase, um, but it's definitely high, highly urbanised. So there's, there's quite a lot of, um, I guess, issues there and those are the things that we've had to contend with for, for a number of years. Um, I won't go through this because it's quite similar, but this is a very similar sort of values that um, the Mooney Ponds Creek has. Looks, it looks pretty similar. Uh, birds are actually just a bit better. Uh, and there's high hopes, I suppose, for birds and fish to, to improve them um, in the Merry Creek. But you can see macroinvertebrates and platypus scores are very low and can, probably will continue to be low. But again, the community um, response is very high, which is that's, that's where our power is, I suppose. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about the water quality issues um, in Melbourne. Um, so some of these pictures here are around stormwater. So I'm going to focus first starting about our urban issues with stormwater. So as probably a lot of you are aware, um, all our drains um, on our streets, in our uh, activity centres, in our shopping centres, at our schools, um, collect water to move it off our streets so we don't get the flooding. Uh, it goes very quickly into our uh, waterways, into our creeks and rivers, and ends up in the Port Phillip Bay. So that's a nice, lovely photo at the top left there of the Port Phillip Bay after a quite a high turbidity or mud event, high sediment event. Um, the one on the right is actually detergent. So that's another issue that we have with um, a lot of our creeks in Melbourne, uh, people washing their cars, perhaps on their driveway or on the street, and all of that detergent ends up uh, in the creek. We also get a number of um, 
shops and businesses like to sweep out their or hose out their shop at the end of the day, especially in those shopping strip malls, and all of that detergent ends up down the creek as well. So I think there's there's still obviously a lot of education that um, needs to go on and a lot of enforcement in certain areas. Um, both both these things are, are highly uh, toxic for a lot of our fish and macroinvertebrates and bird life, particularly the detergents. Another issue that we have with stormwater pollution, of course, is litter, which we're all quite familiar with here today. Um, about 60,000 truckloads of litter and about 50% of that cigarette butts and other pollutants enter our waterways each year via the stormwater systems. Uh, and the majority of the litter that most of us are finding, those that are, of us that are collecting data on litter, uh, the majority of it is plastic. Um, so, for example, the majority of the litter picked up by the community within the Merry Creek catchment um, was soft plastic from the 2018 to 2020 when we've been collecting data. Um, and most of it's, um, yeah, plastic bags, uh, plastic bags broken down and food packaging, that kind of thing. Um, so the, the picture down the bottom there is a, a paint. So that was actually from a printing press. So there is still those um, occasional and uh, sometimes they happen more often than we'd like to. Uh, spills of pollution coming in from um, from different in industries that for some reason there's been a, a spillage uh, and that's ended up in our creeks as well. Um, and I must say Jane does an excellent job, Friends of Mary Creek on Facebook, the Friends of Mary Creek Facebook page when people report things to, to remind them to please report them to the EPA so they can follow them up and do some enforcement. But unfortunately, there's, there seems to be a lot more of these spillages happening than we can always trace back to where they're coming from because our stormwater drain system is so extensive. So it can be difficult sometimes to find out where's this come from. And we're, and we're dealing with that with litter as well. We've been collecting data on the litter and we're, and we're trying to work out where is it coming from. And that can be quite difficult to figure out. Another issue that we have on our waterways is weeds. Um, so weeds um, can take over certain areas. Um, they can adapt to the more harsh conditions that some areas have, uh, which it means there's loss of habitat. There's less habitat for the local plants and animals that we want to be able to survive there. Some weeds have drastic effects on the riparian system on the hydrology. So they can actually, like things like willows, can actually change the flow. Uh, they can actually Main, make the river bend and meander around in different ways uh, in a much quicker way. They can build up silt as well and so create sort of hills of silt in certain areas where you, where you might need deep pools. So certain fish species, some of our native fish species need quite deep pools to breed, as do our frogs. Growling grass frogs need quite deep areas to breed and to live. So if you've suddenly got banks of silt, uh, they can no longer live there. Uh, other things that weeds can do also is shading out of ground level as well and in stream and take over those areas um, of in stream where we would have had some native vegetation that uh, frogs and fish and other species would have fed on, but they are no longer there anymore. And a lot of weeds take over areas in stream and they actually take up a lot of the oxygen that's, that's in that river system as well. So that, that oxygen is no longer available for uh, in stream animals. Another issue that we get is bed and bank erosion. Uh, some of this comes from, um, a lot of it's comes from stormwater, the drains taking the water off the, off the streets, as we've mentioned, due to climate change. We're getting um, rainfall events that are much more extreme. So there's less of them, um, and they're, but when they do come, they're quite heavy. And that means the velocity, the flow of the, of the, the, the creek is quite, fast so that then shoots into the drains and it comes out we've got lots of outputs coming when you're in an urban area there a lot of outputs are put in to the creek system to move that water off the uh, off the uh, house off the um, streets really quickly so that results in a, in a heavy rainfall event it can shoot into the creek really quickly which means you get undercutting so you get um, beds cut away over time, you know, as that water comes in, it's quite a strong thing. So you can see that picture on the left, that's actually a small tributary on the Yarra, actually Salt Creek in Rosanna Parklands. And the, the three um, volunteers there are standing um, over an area that's been really severely undercut. You can see that poor a eucalyptus tree behind them barely holding on, all its roots exposed there. And, and the three of them are basically standing on um, almost bedrock. There's just no organic matter, no topsoil left there at all. So that's a really hard area to try and rehabilitate as well and bring back habitat. And of course, what happens is the creek just continually grows and grows and grows until you've got hardly any creek left. And that's a big issue in urban areas. We, are, we already have a lack of open space. There's not more areas for it to move out. It's a really difficult one. 
Uh, this the one at the bottom here is talking uh, a bit about I guess inappropriate development. So this particular private school has been built right right on the edge of the Yarra River, but probably before as it was being built or just before that the Yarra River and that section was probably a little bit. Um, going in, it wasn't as exposed, I suppose, but over time, as we've had those high rainfall events, you're getting more and more undercutting. So it almost appears as if that um, that building is right on the edge. And you do wonder in the next decade or so what's going to happen to the foundations of that building. So, yeah, inappropriate development um, is still a really big issue. And it's one that Friends of Mary Creek and uh, MCMC and other groups do go to VCAT quite often to um, advocate for really thinking about how does some of this development, uh, how should it be along our rivers and creeks? You know, that some of it's too, still quite too close to our um, the banks of our rivers and creeks and causes a lot of problems as well. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about data. <laughs> we collect a lot of it <laughs> and um, we, it's really a good thing to use. Um, because it provides some really good evidence of, of these changes. A lot of us can see it antidotally as we walk along the rivers and creeks, but it's not until you actually have that physical data that you can actually say for certain and convince others, more importantly, what changes are actually going on. So I've had some great um, Melbourne University students this year put together this graph that you can see here, which is actually on the turbidity versus rainfall in the Mary catchment. So you can see that top picture is actually of the Mary Creek um, during a high turbidity event. And the, the graph itself, what the students were looking at was what's causing this turbidity. Uh, and one, I guess, hypothesis was, well, maybe it's just the rainfall. We're getting more rainfall. So because we have more rainfall, it's picking up more soil and other impurities um, along our catchment and it's bringing it into the creek. If you have a look at that top uh, orange line, um, the straight line is the trend line. Um, with you've got the data sets there from the Bureau of Meteorology, that's their rainfall data over the last six years. So we've started from 2014 to the present. And you can see the trend line is showing there hasn't been a huge change in rainfall over the last six years. It's sort of stayed around the 50, 50 millimetres, um, oh, sorry, 50 centimetres looks like in this key, uh, average over the six years. But if you have a look at the bottom line, which is the blue line, the turbidity, um, you can see uh, this was about 5,000 data sets the students looked at. Uh, it was Water Watch data, it was data from DELP, it was data from Melbourne Water, um, where, uh, data from universities, where they, wherever they could get it from, on turbidity taken, so the muddiness of the water taken on the Mary Creek in different sections all over the, the creek. And you can see clearly, looking at that trend line, that turbidity has increased quite significantly. So what you want, um, an excellent reading um, is under 10. That's what, the, for good water quality, you want under 10 NTUs. That's what that scale is reading in there, or nephthalene turbidity units. You want around 10 to 15. And, you know, most of the time, Mary Creek is quite clear. We don't use, you know, we didn't used to have a lot of problems with turbidity. But you can see over the last six years, it has climbed quite steadily to having a lot more events where it's, it's over, you know, over 20. We're getting up to, you know, averaging 30 or 40, which if, if you have that turbidity for a longer period of time, if it, go, if it goes on for weeks and weeks, um, that has a huge, um, detri hugely detrimental effect on the aquatic life in the creek. So we can really quite safely say, well, it's not just from rainfall that we're getting high turbidity. It's obviously a lot of other human activities that are going on and the things that we're putting in place to try and reduce that turbidity are not working at this stage. More needs to be done. Um, some of the other issues, loss of in-stream habitat. Um, some of you are probably familiar with that picture at the top, the beautiful Mooney Ponds Creek and all its lovely concrete. So obviously not having any habitat in-stream or on the banks does have an impact on the water quality. The quality of the water is not as good. And you're not going to get um, a lot of those animals we're talking about. You're not going to get that macroinvertebrates. You're not going to get fish. You're not going to get platypus. And it's also just not a really nice area to be in really. It's quite an unattractive area to be in. And of course, with um, climate change and we're getting hotter summers and more sunlight and more heat, you can imagine how hot this area would get in summer. And uh, the, the creek is sort of just through the bottom there, going through there, how hot the temperature of that water would be. And of course, you're only going to get certain pest fish uh, and other animals that can actually withstand those hot temperatures and that lack of oxygen and that no shade. So you're just not going to have that biodiversity anymore. 
One of the other things I wanted to mention just briefly was around uh, presence of barriers to fish migration. So I'll just go to the next picture here. This is actually Coburg Lake, which many of you are probably familiar with, uh, with the, the dam wall up there. So there's a lot of these dam walls still um, on the Mooney Ponds and Mary Creek and other waterways around Melbourne. And of course, they they cause a big problem for our flow. So they reduce the flow, they reduce the oxygen in our rivers and creeks. Um, and they also mean that fish can't migrate. So if we want to have a lot of our native fish in our rivers and creeks, we could certainly introduce them, but if they can't breed, they're obviously we're going to have to constantly restock them. So we need um, ways to actually get fish moving up and down uh, our rivers and creeks, because some of them rely on moving up and downstream to actually breed. So you can see in this first picture, this is actually uh, a fish uh, ladder that was put in um, that's sort of, you know, on the side of the, the Coburg Lake. I, I don't know, maybe someone can talk about this when we get to the discussion. I don't know if there's been any um, studies released on how effective this has been. Has this been working? I, I don't know. I haven't had an opportunity or a chance to look for you know, any research on this. And I know they're, they're putting in a number of these fish ladders in our urban streams, but I, I'd love to hear more about how successful they've been. Um, the other thing that uh, in that report, I showed you Melbourne Water, that co-design report, there's actually plans to remove a lot of fish barriers. So that, that's really great, but some of them are not planned for a few decades. So there's a lot to go and it's very slow moving. I wanted to, so that was all a bit depressing, <laughs> but I wanted to now talk about some of the solutions because there's some really awesome things going on. Um, so um, I wanted to just sort of finish with that. This picture here is of the Merry Creek and the upper reaches around Maryang. So this is a, um, a landholder um, property who's, they've been very heavily involved in uh, land care and other community work over the years. And you can just see what a beautiful section of the Merry Creek this is. Look, look at all those great um, inputs that it has. It's got river red gum so it's got lots of shade and, and older trees so it's got lots of habitat obviously um, for the arboreal mammals and, and birds and others uh, in its treetops and lots of shade for the, for the creek when it needs it um, and then you've got lots of in-stream vegetation you can see water ribbon in there and there's a few other species as well um, and some lovely deep pools as well so that's great breeding habitat for fish and frogs you can also see the stony knoll in the foreground those basalt rocks so that's a, a really important E um, ecological vegetation community as well, the stoly, stony knoll grasslands, which are fast disappearing. So it's, it's thanks to some of these amazing landholders that have really looked after an area, uh, made sure they haven't removed the trees and, and kept these sort of slow meandering sections of the Merry Creek that mean that we really have an idea of what things look like what they should still look like. And this is what a lot of our um, ecological restoration team at, at Mary Creek, this is what they use. This is where they'll go and collect their seeds. And this is where what they would use to say, well, this is what it should look like. This is what we should be starting to put back in where we've lost it, where it's possible. So some of the things, um, of course, water sensitive urban design that um, a lot of stakeholders, our stakeholders and land managers are putting in to our urban areas that will slow the water down. So. Uh, this this is a great diagram. It really shows clearly that the rain and stormwater pollution rush down the street gutter into these rain gardens. And these rain gardens are full of gravel, sand in layers, and you've got your plants planted in the top there. So they trap the water. They basically slow it down. As I mentioned, the velocity and the sedimentation in the water are the main problems. And this sort of tackles both of them. It slows the water down so it infiltrates really slowly through the gravel and sand ends up um, in a, you know instead of just quickly you know in minutes it takes hours or days to actually get down to this um, this little slotted pipe and then it'll flow down into a into the local river or creek uh, the plants also will trap things like plastics and microplastics as well uh, which may I mean, and as long as they're maintained as long as someone comes along and actually sucks out all that uh, stuff that they collect they work really well so they are really excellent uh, way of um, slowing down our water uh, and also trapping a lot of the um, sedimentation that's in it. I just wanted to mention down the bottom here, um, and you can Google it, the city of Darabin have a stormwater savvy interactive map. So they've actually showcased a number of the different rain gardens and water sensitive urban design that they've put around their council. So it's not hasn't got everything, but it's got a number of them that you can if you're into that thing, this sort of thing, which I certainly am, <laughs> can go and check them out and see how they sort of, where they're sort of situated. And they're putting in, like most councils, more and more all the time. 
So there's lots of examples of this water sensitive urban design. You've got yeah, rain gardens, as I mentioned, they can be, people obviously can build them in their houses as well in their gardens. Melbourne Water has some excellent instructions on how to put a rain garden in. And I've also noticed Gardening Australia have a, you can get it on YouTube, they have a, uh, an instruction video on how to do, make a rain garden in your backyard. Um, there's also tree pits. Tree pits are put in, they're like rain gardens, but they're much smaller. So they're for like sort of busy um, activity centres like sh um, shopping strips and things where you might not have the, the room for other things. But if you've got the room, you can put things in like swales or constructed wetlands. And constructed wetlands are great because you can also have the habitat there as well. You can increase the biodiversity of an area as well. And they just create a really nice amenity. They're nice uh, part of the open space for people to walk around as well. Um, some of the other things that have been happening as well with the community, we might not be able to put in water sensitive urban design, but we can do things like collect litter and report to our stakeholders and to the community on, on, on what the data is telling us. So I mentioned before about plastic. Um, this is data collected by um, volunteers um, as part of the rapid response to litter after rainfall program that we've been running for the last three years. And you can see that this has got this this data analysis was put together by um, a group of Melbourne Uni students I, I had with me. And I noticed Wei was here today. So Wei, who's on, on this in this group, was one of the people that put this together. So um, I really thank a lot of my Melbourne Uni students and other students that I have come and helped me because I certainly don't have the time I, to put all this data together. But it's so crucial because if we're not telling people what's there, how can we create change? So you can see here the top four litter items are all made out of plastic, you know. Uh, there's a bit of metal, scrap metal in the middle and then there's plastic drink bottles and then we've got uh, plastic non-foil wrap. Then we get down to straws, confection sticks, cigarette butts and filters. So most of the litter we're getting is, is plastic. Now this isn't directly from the stormwater drain itself. This is what it had been collecting on the beds and banks. We don't really encourage people to collect litter straight in the stormwater drain because you'd have to put waders in and actually get in the, in, the, in the water, which is not very safe. So this is what's been collecting and sometimes for weeks or months has been sitting in situ um, just on the beds and banks of, of the Merry Creek. So um, it's a obviously an ongoing problem. We, we don't really look at um, microplastics. This is this la things larger than sort of a centimetre or two, but it really gives you an, an idea of the extent of the, prog of, of the problem. Some of the other things that we collect data on, um, citizen science is, is pretty much what I do in my, in my role. And there's so many programs now, isn't it? I'm sure most of you are quite familiar with them um, that are here today. There's just so many, and most of you probably had a go at a few of them. So there's Frog Census that you can collect. There's great, there's great maps. I was just talking to Whittlesea Landcare the other night, and I was showing them maps that you can now download of the data. And they've actually put data in since the 70s. So you can look at data from the mid 70s of frog species. Uh, and we now need data though to compare it. So a lot of the areas, this is up in the Whittlesea, so the upper catchment of the Merry, we don't have any more recent data. Some of it's not since been collected since the early 2000s. So I think there's definitely a gap there for people to go into some of these areas and, and record the data. What's, what's going on now? We had, you know, a certain amount of frog species on the Merry, you know, 20 years ago. Are they still there or not? You know, and now that we have that evidence from the past, we need to add the evidence from the future to see where we're currently at. We've also got the Water Watch portal, which collects all the water quality data. Some of it I shared with you today, like that turbidity data, um, that's available for anyone in the community. If you want to know what the water quality is like um, in the Mary or Mooney Ponds Creek or any creek in Victoria where people are collecting data, it's all done by volunteers. You can go online and get that. Uh, Litter Watch Victoria is a new Litter Watch portal that people can access the data as well. Um, iNaturalist and the ALA um, and Birds Australia collect data on um, biodiversity. So particular species and some of you might have been involved obviously in the recently the birds in backyard study um, and of course then there's the water bug blitz so that's collecting data on those great little guys down here the water bugs um, so I run two community sessions each year in spring and autumn that's the optimum time that water bugs are active and we go out into the Mary Creek up the top here, as you can see, uh, sections on the Mo on the Mary Creek to collect the data. It'd be really interesting to include the Mooney Ponds Creek in the future, perhaps. I don't think there's any data collected there at the moment, but uh, really good idea to have based, we're really basically collecting data to see what bugs are occurring here now, comparing it with the past and also into the future. So we know where to
where to focus our, our energies, I guess. So that's something that people can be involved in. We train you in identifying uh, the water bugs and helping with the, the collecting the data. This is the water quality info that you can access. So the Water Watch portal I mentioned, um, all the volunteers I work with have put together summaries. So that's what that is at down the bottom of the data they've collected and more importantly telling you what that means. <laughs> so you've got the parameters but what do they actually mean? What What is good river health for say dissolved oxygen and are we getting it in certain in this areas that they're collecting data? So they're all available on the Mary Creek Management Committee website. Um, EPA also has um, citizen science projects and Yarra Watch, which is and summer water quality reports. So you can go and look at their website to see during the summer, should I be swimming in the Port Phillip Bay? You know, their beach watch is really important and they have a Yarra Watch as well. Though I have noticed over the last couple of years, there's less data available. They seem to be scaling it back a bit for some reason. Um, DELP also has a water man me measurement information system that you can collect data. Of course, there's the frog census data, little watch data. And I'm working at the moment with RMIT and we're planning to put in three in three sites on the Merry Creek, there's going to be multi-probe sensors. So currently at the moment, the Water Watch groups just go out once a month and collect water quality data. We will now have sensors that will collect um, turbidity data. Uh, I think it's just water temperature and light at the moment. And there's going to be one spot that's got a multi-probe, so it'll be collecting other parameters in Coburg. Um, basically every half an hour, every hour. And some of those sites community can access the data via their smartphone. So that's a really exciting project coming up later this year as well. And, and I'll have a webinar on, on the data that we find from that next year. Um, I've got a couple of questions here. One from David uh, Redford. David had asked about uh, the washing cars with detergents, which I think is a real issue. Um, what can you tell us about actions that have been taken to try and educate or, or prohibit that type of activity? So there's a number of, th I guess the main one is education um, and there is some enforcement. So I have actually dobbed some people in. You can actually, if you see, um, not people washing their car, but say I've seen um, painters, house painters actually washing their brushes um, just down the drain and, and you can see that paint going down into the drain and into the creek. So you can actually contact um, your local laws officers at council and, they, and there's, that's actually enforceable. Um, you've got to catch them in the act actually to, to do that. So it's got to be quick. <laughs> um, but if you see that happening regularly and you know what business it is, you can certainly report it. As into detergents and washing cars, the main tool I guess we have in our toolbox is education. So that's why I mention it pretty much any time I talk about stormwater, I talk about washing your cars. Um, and particularly to schools. So I do a lot of schools education. So I talk to the kids about how do your parents wash their car. Um, and obviously giving those solutions around um, going to a car wash. Most of the car washes now have triple interceptors where they actually clean and treat the water and reuse it. So mm. going to one of those places is, is pretty important. Or washing your car on grass and using a phosphate-free car wash detergent so that the water will trickle through um through the soil and end up in the creek that way. And obviously, if you're using low phosphate free detergent, you're going to have less of those nutrients that are causing those problems. All right. Look, uh, the next question is from uh, your good friend, Damien. He's uh, asked about. Um, Hard at work there. Good on you, Damien. <laughs> yep. The question is Julia, when picking up a litter from the creek, what priority should we apply? From the classics, the worst. So, should they be removed? I mean, you yeah. might like to add to that, do you? Want yeah, I would. Uh, just to maximise the ecological benefit of a finite amount of time litter picking, I uh, want to take the stuff that's doing the most harm first. Mm. What do you recommend? Smaller, probably the smaller pieces. Um, obviously, macro and micro plastics are probably the biggest issue. Anything that's plastic um, is probably the biggest issue. Um, but you know, it's it's all pretty bad. I suppose if you had to pick, say, if you saw cardboard and there was a whole lot of plastic, you'd choose the plastic, for example, yeah. I suppose. Plastic is probably the worst thing. Um, you um, know, if there's any organic... Oh, sorry, go on, Damien. Oh, within plastic, I've got this, like, piece of crumbling foam that looks pretty awful, like it's really going to spread itself a lot, whereas, yep. a, like, a plastic bottle's going to take a long time to de to split up. And oh, yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah, that's that's probably a good point. Something that's going to yeah, bust up into a million pieces is probably more important than something that, you know, you could probably come back and pick up later that's yeah. going to keep its 
shape for longer. I hadn't thought of that. That's a good point. Um, polystyrene is also a big issue. I should have mentioned that too on our rivers and creeks. Um, mm-hmm. Yarra River Keepers have just done a, a webinar that you can watch and they've done a report on, on – they've done a research on polystyrene as well. So that's a good one to check out as well. Yeah, thanks, uh, Trevor. And thanks, Julie, for a terrific presentation and to Wei for giving you um, some help along the way. Um, I follow um, the rewilding kind of movement in the UK, um, you know, of people trying to reintroduce iconic species like the beaver and, you know, the wild cat in Scotland and so on. Um, I noticed the fairly depressing prospect you had for, you know, platypus and that sort of thing in the Mary. Do you see any kind of um, hope for a kind of rewilding strategy maybe to kind of galvanise um, public opinion further? I think that's an excellent idea, Peter. Um, I would certainly be supportive of that. Um, perhaps that's what it needs. Perhaps the platypus in the Mary and Mooney Ponds Creek needs a, a specific target by a, by a community group perhaps to, to target it. I think there's just not enough resources that have been put aside for it. And obviously there's a lot of issues. All the issues I talked about today is why the platypus aren't there because their food source aren't there. So that needs to be sorted before you would, you know, before platypus will come back. Platypus have been seen on the Mary Creek, obviously. Um, there's, there's obviously, and I'm not sure about the Mooney Ponds Creek. Maybe someone can mention about the Mooney Ponds, but the Mary Creek, they do, you notice a, a now and then a platypus will swim up from the Yarra River because they'll swim up from the Yarra. But there's just no food for them, so they'll just turn around and go back. So they just can't maintain a population at the moment due to lack of food source. So perhaps that's what it needs. Perhaps it needs a task force specifically around raising that issue about platypus and and maybe some sections on the creeks could be put aside for rewilding and and then if the bugs, you know, increase in those areas and the platypus is able to get there, then you might have some, you know, a viable population. Anna, you wanted to ask yeah. a question. Uh, just a couple of things. Uh, we haven't had platypus um, re- around here, of course, but um, right. we have had some sightings of Rakali, which has been really, oh yeah, um, which has been really exciting because I think that's another measure of um, um, of a healthy. And that's where this Rakali has been spotted. It's near the nursery corner, which is going to be developed soon by Muni Valley, which is exciting. And but it's also just a little bit upstream of the concrete, so it just is a really good illustration of the difference of habitat that can happen once that bit of concrete is removed. And as you know, with the section that's going to be removed over the next years, it'll be interesting to see how the wildlife moves down into a rehabilitated rehabilitated section of the creek. The other thing, if you don't mind to mention, on the uh, coming up in the next um, next week, the 8th to the 15th of November is pollinator week. So we mustn't forget the the uh, birds uh, with the bees and, and uh, that's particularly as I know along Mary Creek, you've done such wonderful work with um, the uh, introduction of habitat for blue banded bees. Yep. But um, it's a good opportunity again for um, particularly for young kids to get involved with a really, really good citizen science project and uh, pollinator week is now linked up with iNaturalist so if you Mm -hmm. are lucky enough to take any photographs of the of the insects and and habitat of your gardens or local parklands they can be uploaded and and end up on the atlas of living australia which is really exciting that's great and i'm glad you mentioned the rakeli um anna because that's right that's another species an iconic species and i was just going to mention this platypus spot that's another app that I forgot to mention, that if you do happen to see Rikali or Platypus, you can put them on that that app. And so then we have some of that baseline data. And I agree with Anna, it'd be really interesting to see, you know, maybe there's a correlation, I'm assuming there might be, between the concrete, like being no Rikali and Platypus, and then the non-concreted areas of the Mooney Ponds Creek. It'd be great mm-hmm. to see that as a, you know, out in a map sort of thing to cl- clearly show that perhaps. No, we finished on time. That's really good. I'm sure people want to get out and about on their Sunday. So, um yeah. Thank and you so just, much, I everyone. Just, I was just going to ask Jane, since she uh, presented before, is there anything you wanted to uh, affirm, confirm? Oh, or? Just um, thanks, Julia, for a fantastic session. There's so much information and it really helps um, to give people a sense of what can practically they can do on um, oh. both an individual level and to join existing groups and just how everything is connected. What I find so useful about this morning is there's an excellent combination of, of education, learning, 
And also, I love the way in which you develop thoughts around pathways for community engagement, whether it's any one of the groups that have been mentioned this morning, but you've also got means by which families and scout groups or whatever can get involved. So thank you. Thank you well, I think that's as important, Trevor, isn't it? I think if you want anyone to be involved, you've got to make it accessible, don't you? You yeah. know, um, you've got to be adaptive. We're not here to conduct a lecture program. We're I know, to... but we could, couldn't we? <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, we're here to motivate people, aren't we? That's right. That's what it's all about, isn't it? And you've got to make it accessible. Um, yeah. You know, you've got to, if I can't make something work for someone, I've got to think a bit more about it, you know, because people have got enthusiasm and you want to harness that. Yeah. You're, all, so you're awesome. Not only oh, for what you've done this morning, but for your uh, for your your hands-on leadership and example that you give to us all for what can be done in the community. Thank you. And I'll say to everyone, my own details are in the flyer. So if anyone's got any questions, just that, contact me. So have a wonderful day, everyone. Have a great Sunday, everyone. See you all Thank again. Thank you so much. Bye, Bye down by the creek. Thank you. Yes.